professional improv, you always hold for the latecomers. Uh, you know, we'll go ahead and start. Uh, you're here for improv duo. If anybody's in the wrong place, go ahead and leave now. <laughs> cool. You're, you're making the right choice. <laughs> awesome. Uh, cool. So can we get a suggestion of a... Oh, it was a bit. I didn't know. I'm like, maybe he really is leaving. And he's like, I thought this was kind of uh, Can we get a suggestion of... Uh, has anybody ever been on a bad vacation? You've all been on wonderful vacations. Fantastic. Where would someone go on a bad vacation? Gary. Where? Gary. Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. Oh, watch Ooh. out. I'm from Gary. <laughs> watch out. You don't have to go all the way to Gary to go around the corner. Oh, I know. Okay. I know. Here we go. Watch yeah. the news. Bob, maybe you should call it quits. Listen, I'm not my dad, all right? I'm just saying, Bob, those have the worst odds. You know that, right? Never tell me the odds. No, th that's the thing. You don't worry about the odds. I've been playing this one slot machine all day, Richard. <laughs> this, this one. I put the coin on the thing. I brought my own bucket so I don't even have to go to the bathroom. I've noticed. <laughs> Frankly, it's disgusting. I put up a little curtain. I stole a little ruffle. I, I watched the whole thing. It, it was a very elaborate production just to go to the restroom. But look, I've watched you put $4,000 in that machine. Okay, maybe it's time to call it quits. I've got an idea. We're going to play a game of poker. If you lose, you can never gamble again. You have to go to your family and care about your family members instead of wasting all your time peeing in a bucket and pulling that slot lever. I will play your game, but I will never care about my family. <laughs> I can't make you do that, okay? I've got family too, I get it. Cool. Your first card's a jack. Higher or lower? Higher. Three. Come on, the odds would say that a jack is toward the top of the deck, right? You know what? You, you're right. <laughs> I'm all in. No! Why are you betting? I wasn't even going to bet you money, okay? I can't do this anymore. Okay? Okay, I, I have an idea. I'm listening. I bet you won't walk out of here right now and leave me behind forever. You know I can't quit you. <laughs> <laughs> Good, because that's a bet my heart didn't want to make. I'm going to help you through this, okay? But you're going to make me a promise. First promise, you're going to empty the bucket and not use the bucket anymore. <laughs> I love this bucket. But get rid of it. It's gross, okay? And it's a signal of your your dependency. You're right. It's time for a change. It is. I'm going to get rid of it. It is. Just put it over there for it, now, okay? Richard? Bet I can hit that guy over there with this bucket. No, you're not going to bet anymore. Look, I'm going to offer you a chance at redemption. We're going to get in that car. We're going to go to the unemployment office. We're going to get you signed up. Promise me you're not going to go back. But if you make that pinky promise, so help me God, don't break it. Kiss it. <laughs> and that's scene. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. You. Uh, hey, that was dumb, and we thought it would be real dumb to start with doing a, an improv scene. Hi, I'm John Colby. I'm Ben Fraley. And uh, we both do uh, comedy sports downtown. We Together we've been doing improv for probably like 25 years or whatever. Um, How long have we been doing it? Four. Okay. Uh, together we've been doing it for 22 years. Uh, I tried to make you sound. It's great. Uh, That's fine. But we both are also coaches, and uh, we've been notice, noticing more and more people are doing improv duos and event, and we invite you to uh, keep doing it. And if your kids go to uh, places where it's being uh, offered, take it. Because number one, it opens up their creativity. It allows them to just come up with new ideas. Um, if you are struggling to fill OP slots, I invite you to have kids do improv. I went through Second City's conservatory program, and the whole idea is improv to write sketch. Um, and so what you can do is have your kids just do improv. I mean, have them do it uh, in, in class, if you teach classes, have them do it after school. But then when they have a good idea, 
have them sit down and write it out and then flush that into a fuller story. Because what you got, what you saw here was two characters. We're going to talk about the whole formatting of all that kind of stuff. But what you saw was two characters going through something. And then what you can do to turn that into OP is make it uh, a bigger event. So uh, I'm going to let Ben talk first. Uh, ben, was, ben and I were frustrated last year um, at a meet over the way they were giving out suggestions and the way it was all going down. And so we were just frustrated with the way uh, people are doing improv poorly because people are just like, hey, it's a supplemental thing. Just let them do whatever. And we don't feel like people really know what's going on. So that's why we're here. And I'll let him kind of talk about that stuff. Yeah. So um, we were looking at some suggestions that were given for when we were judging improv duo. And you open up the suggestion and it says, oh, Donald Trump and Mother Teresa are putting together a bookcase. All right, and you look at that and you give that to the kid. That kid gets absolutely no freedom, no choice, whatever. That paper has just said, here's the character you have to be, here's the thing you have to do. And as a judge, it sucks because you're gonna watch six people do horrible Trump impressions <laughs> while building a bookcase and something goes wrong and then it gets done at the end. That's what happens in all of them. Yeah, and so we were looking at that and we wanna to talk today about how to change up suggestions if you're hosting, how to make suggestions that really work, and how to train your kids to approach those suggestions, how to approach them with the different pieces. So um, do we want to give some suggestions of like yeah. what those look like? Yeah, I want to get my list because it's hilarious. Yeah, Go ahead. so um, a suggestion normally that we would get in improv is you get an occupation, get a relationship, get a, um, a location, get some kind of food item, get a sport, anything that's general that I can take whatever. And when you're teaching your kids, um, always follow up whatever you say with the phrase, whatever that means to you, or whatever that looks like to you. That lets them be completely open and I can say, your suggestion is football, whatever that means to you. Then they can take it. Um, when you're training them or practicing with them and teaching them. Um, I like to use something that I call the three beyond technique uh, that I teach my kids in speech is where I give you a suggestion. Then I want you to make one logical connection. So if I give you football, I will step forward when I've made one connection. Then I will step forward again and I will say George Foreman. All right? You might not know how I got there, but in my head, I went football, I went cookout, and then George Foreman, I connected cookout with grill. All right? And so then I might do a scene about George Foreman, and you might go, well, how did he get there? But I took whatever that meant to me, and I just moved it a couple steps beyond to get something that was creative, something that was different, that wasn't just going, your suggestion is screwdriver. Here's the screwdriver. Thank you. And that's what happens, and neither kid knows what happens next. Um, so I want to, I, I was thinking, like, what can, what can these people do if you don't know how to get suggestions? And again, it can be locations, all that kind of stuff. So I literally Googled improv duo speech team. Uh, the very first thing that came up was the Illinois Elementary School Association. Uh, and it's just like, speech prompts for improv. And here's a list. It's like, you want a humorous one? The very first one says, look at that baby's head. Um, and that made my day already because now it, like, you can give them a single line of dialogue. And now they can go anywhere you want with that. And whatever their interpretation of that can be all over the place. A serious one is like, this day could not get any worse. But it doesn't tell me what happened, what went on or whatever, but it gives you a setup. And the other one I really liked was, oh no, not the mustard. Uh, so um, it's, it's as simple as Googling um, suggestions and you can find stuff, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up, uh, does anybody host a meet and plan on hosting a meet? Cool, if you host a meet, please do improv duo. Here's all you have to do, okay? And first of all, here's the rules. If you look online, there's different places. I go to everybody's number one source for information, Wikipedia. I looked up to see what they said about it, because that's where everybody goes. It says give the kids two minutes to prepare and then blank amount of time to perform. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've been to ones where it said two minutes to prepare, five minutes to speak, 
We've been two minutes to prepare, four minutes, two minutes to prepare, three minutes, to, uh, and then one minute to prepare, and four minutes. And so all of those kind of make sense. Uh, if you notice what we did, we literally talked for a couple seconds, and then we did a scene that was probably about three minutes long. What I would advise you do is tell the kids you have no more than two minutes to prepare, but all together you get five. So if you only need one minute, or if you only need 30 seconds, and I have an uh, improv team at the school, and literally they get a couple seconds and then go, because it, it really, you're turning improv into kind of like extent because you're getting them two minutes to practice it. And for newer competitors, they want to do that. But as they get better, they'll use less of that two minutes, and then they have more of their time to kind of get into their scene. Okay? okay. And that's so, not improv, that's scripting. When they have that much time, yeah. two to three minutes to prep, all they're doing is going, first I'm going to say this, then you say this, I'll walk to the chair, you put a hat on. So and, and so, what we did was like, Gary, I'm like, okay, I've been to a casino in Gary. So I, I walked over, right, that's what you do at Gary. So I walked over and I'm like, this is Peter Casino. And that's all I did. Like, because if you get the suggestion of, look at that baby's head, you need to dis determine something, okay? Determine where we are, determine what's going on. It's just like, uh, give them um, an idea of where to start. That's really all you need, and then let them go. Okay, so that's our idea. If you're going to host, say you get up to two minutes, but your whole time is five minutes. So the less time you use setting it up, the more time you'll get to perform. Now, as a judge, I would advise you put something on your little judge sheet. Tell them that when they get to, if they want uh, like a 30 second heads up, you can do the 30 second, and then when your time is up. But as a judge, I would even advise you to put a note in there saying, be flexible with it. Because the whole point of improv, you're supposed to be in the moment, you're making it up. And so when, you're, when your people are constantly trying to look over, it's pulling them out of the moment. So every now and then they're going to look over and if they see you holding up the time's up, whatever, and you go a little over, I would be a little flexible with that. That's just a personal thing, you can do what you want. Cool? Because if I see this and I'm doing improv and I happen to glance and I see you doing this, in my mind that's, let's start wrapping it up. Yeah, wrap it up because you don't want to just, I mean, you want them to have a conclusion, okay? So now let's talk about how you coach it. Awesome. Um, I'm going to give you a handy dandy thing that I'm going to put in the improv book I write someday. Uh, and it, the letters are C, E, C, E. And, and those four letters will give you the four things you're going to need. And C, E, C, E is really easy for a kid to remember. Cool? The first C stands for character. Have them play a character of some type. I, in my brain, I was just a dealer at a casino in Gary, Indiana. And obviously he was someone with an addiction. If you have an addiction, please call 1-800-GAMBLING. They can help you. Cool. Uh, but with your character, there are rules to creating characters. The, the most important rule is there should be a pre-established relationship between these characters. Don't have them be strangers. If the two of them are strangers, you're going to get teaching scenes and you're going to get transaction scenes. And those are the worst. I'm going to teach you how to swing a bat. I'm going to teach you how to golf. I'm going to teach you how to deal cards, whatever. Uh, or just like, hi, welcome to Walmart. Can I help you? Yeah, would you like, you know, I'd like to buy you know, this Because now we don't care about each other. Yep. Here's why. Um, if you think about it, you have a certain level of uh, couth when you are speaking to perfect strangers. But you will be horrible, horrible individuals when you're talking to your own friends and family. Right? <laughs> we want to watch that. Right? That's why, that's why we love reality TV. We want to watch them get to know The first episode, they're always okay, but once they know each other, they flip, like, they lose their cool, they flip out on each other. So that's what we want to watch. We want to see that kind of stuff. Cool? So that's character. The next thing is E, and that stands for environment. So at the very beginning of the scene, you want to have two people somewhere and doing something. So right at the beginning, he was pulling a slot machine, I was dealing cards. So you have uh, an environment. You don't have to use it the whole time, but it gives you something to do. I will tell you, teach your kids, if, you, if your brain locks up and you don't know what to do, go back to just physically doing something. So if you don't, if you don't know what to do, I mean, there could be a second where I just deal the cards, I kind of laid them out, whatever, and I was just kind of thinking, where do we want to go with this? And I'm like, oh, he has an addiction. That's where we'll kind of take it or whatever. So allowing that environment kind of, kind of helps you uh, choose uh, where we are, and it gives you something to do. Cool. C, the second C stands for conflict. Something has to go wrong. And I will tell you, the conflict does not have to be between the two people. A lot of times the conflict can be the two of us work at Subway, and what's a conflict when we're working at Subway? There's a rat 
Yeah, there's a rat, and we're the freaking inspector's going to be by later today, so the two of us have to catch this rat. Man, the hijinks are going to ensue, right? But it's the two of us together trying to, to figure stuff out. This is a good thing if you're an English teacher and you want to talk about, like, the seven different stories, man versus man, man versus nature, man versus God. You want to get into all that kind of stuff? You can really take all this improv stuff and, like, use it to talk about story art with the six points of plot structure or, the like, the different stuff. So you can end up turning this into so much more. Uh, but conflict is basically saying, let the scene go on, but within the first, I like to say, within the first 30 seconds, have something happen. And, and keep in mind, you don't have to have both people there in the scene at all times. Mm -hmm. right? So like he said, because it made me think when he said man versus God, if I want to be some kind of deity or some kind of conscious or something, I can be outside the scene while he's doing something and be like, don't touch that. What? Yeah. Don't, don't make eye contact with me. Awesome. Right? And I can just be this <laughs> I person. I my eyes. <laughs> um, That's better. The, the, and yeah, and when he's saying that, you're, you're two characters at the beginning. There's no rule about how many characters you can play. So he can walk off and then be God. And then he can come back on as the pit boss at the casino or whatever. So you can play multiple characters. Um, in, what is it, three years of watching Improv Duo, I've seen one duo where somebody played another character. Like every other duo I've ever seen, and I'll tell you they won. I'm like, oh crap, that's different. And your whole idea is just to go beyond. I don't say crap on the camera. Yeah, you did. Okay. Um, uh, your whole idea is to go beyond what everybody else is doing. Cool. Um, and then the last E is emotion. And I will tell you that C, standing for conflict, doesn't matter until we have an emotional reaction to it. Um, and that simply means whatever is said in the scene can be your conflict as long as the other person cares about it. Um, I will tell you, you can put a good improviser with a bad improviser and they will make it work. Um, and the reason is the bad improviser can literally say anything and the good improviser will emotionally react to it. Um, also, I think this is a good thing to do when your kids are writing OPs because it gives you an opportunity to watch um, and, and side coach. Um, and so side coaching is where you sit and watch them do improv, but you, as the person, number one, you're sitting outside, number two, you're older and you have more experience. So sitting outside means you're not in the moment trying to perform, so your brain can think a little more calmly. And then number two, you have more life experience, so you'd be like, oh, a casino, this kind of thing could happen, or a subway, this kind of thing could happen. So what you do is you throw out either things to add to the scene or things they care that they can care about. So when somebody walks up and, and so often people just don't have an emotional reaction to it, it's just like, um, hey, I broke my nail. That hurts. And that's kind of what happens. We don't have anything. But if Ben can think of any type of reason why me breaking my nail is a big deal, he can emotionally react to it and watch what a, a difference it can make. This no! I needed that for the sacrifice. I didn't. What you mean to sac what, sacrifice my nails? It's a very specific God rule. Oh, okay. so yeah. But then again, I, as weird as that is, the fact that he cares about it is what matters. And the thing is, I've worked with improv partners before. Um, I do an improv show with a, a guy, and sometimes we bring up somebody from the audience who has no experience doing improv at all, and we make them look good because whatever they say, it's the most important thing in the world to us. So you just react to it. So if somebody breaks their nail, I need it for the sacrifice. If somebody breaks their nail, then you're going to lose your hand modeling contract and we're going to be out on the streets in a week. You break your nail and it's just like, are you kidding me? Prom is in two hours. You're going to look like an idiot. And like Whatever it is, it just has to matter. And as long as it matters to both parties, it's, up that, that it's going to be something. So what you do on the outside is wait for a line and then if you're not seeing any emotional reactions, within 30 seconds, Pause. Literally say pause. Ben, pick an emotion. Any emotion you want. Pick one. <sighs> cool. Now don't make notice notice when I say pick an emotion, he doesn't make any verbal word he doesn't use words. He just makes a, a physical uh, visualization of that emotion. And now you go, why do you feel that way? Why do you feel that? And again, I'm I keep jumping into OP because we're all our kids are writing OPs right now. But the thing is, I'm like, okay, so what's the emotion there? Like, I don't know. I'm like, cool, then nobody else cares. Like, we don't care until you have emotion. Cool, what's your emotion? I don't even care what it is. You're going to be nervous. Okay, now why are you nervous? And what it does is it make them, makes them think about subtext. Makes them think about what's going on in their character's brain. And kind of putting all that kind of stuff together um, can, can just, like, 
help create more story. Either they're nervous because of this, like, oh, okay, now we have more backstory. Now we can go add more to the exposition. Because if you have a kid write a, has anybody ever had a kid write an OP and the first version was more than four minutes? Because all of my kids are like, I have an OP. I'm like, it's a single sheet of paper, buddy. I'm like, that's not 10 minutes. You have an idea. So then what you do is you help them figure out the storyline from there. Cool? Yeah, I want to say one more thing about environment before we move on. Um, rule state. They get two of these. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not let them be trapped. <laughs> Do not teach them to be trapped by the chair. I've seen too many where the kids sit down and they stay down for the rest of the scene. And they just sit and they have a face-to-face -face interview and they're like, all right, let's talk. And then you get a profile and you get two people sitting in chairs. That's terrible. And with that side coaching, you can tell them, get out of the chair. If they sit down, just be like, stay, stand up, pick a reason. Yes. And typically the chairs don't even have to be chairs. No. No, nope, they don't have to be anything predetermined. They can just be like, oh, this is a rocket ship that I'm going to get in right now. And so. And you have to sit in a rocket ship backwards. You do. Like on good times. <laughs> uh, cool. So do you have any questions about anything before we go to the next phase of the workshop? Yeah. So one of the things that we've had trouble with is getting the kids to be willing to have those emotions pick one and express it, they're reluctant to do that. What are some, some tools you can use to kind of get them out of that hesitancy? Cool, uh, can everybody stand up and get in a circle? Well, we're, gonna, we're gonna do some kind of improv stuff. No, for real, everybody stand up, yeah. we're gonna get in a big circle kind of between so these two tables. tables. Yeah, these we're gonna play, you know what I hate. You know what I hate. That's, we're gonna play that, so I'll go. Everybody reacts to it. Yep. Come on around, cool. circles all the way around. Some people be in front of the camera. So yeah, we start looking at it. Uh, I'm a, go ahead and fill it on the other side. It's a circle, not a U. Cool. Um, I'm, a, I'm a theater teacher. In the first two weeks of the year in my theater classes, we play uh, improv games because it, while it just looks like we're playing, we're actually working on a bunch of skills that I then tie in later. But I also teach speech. I also teach mass media. But I play improv in all of my classes the first couple of days because it helps loosen people up. And just playing these kind of games helps everybody kind of get what's going on. So here's how this game works. And, and I'm, I'm not going to be the only one performing. You'll all be doing it too. Cool. The game's called, Do You Know What I Hate? And then this game, I step into the middle. I go, Do You Know What I Hate? And then you guys yell out stuff. It's important to note, if you play this with your kids, <laughs> don't actually yell out anything you would hate, like uh, specific genders or races or anything like that. You yell out things that you normally wouldn't hate. So people are like, potatoes or teddy bears. You yell out something very simple, cool? So then what happens is, and literally you all yell out stuff, I'll pick one, I'll take it, and then I start getting mad about it because I hate it. And I'm gonna name one thing that I hate about it. And I want all of you to agree with me. You're all like, oh. that first one is just like a three on that emotional level, cool? And I'm gonna say a second thing I hate about it. You're all gonna go up to like a four or a five. When I say that third thing, you're gonna lose your stuff and you're all gonna get angry. And let's talk about physical anger. When you get mad, raise your hand right now and do this with your kids. Raise your hand right now and tell me what, what physically happens to you when you get mad. Give me some examples, what do you do? Tense up. Yeah, you tense up, so I wanna see that. What else? Increase in breathing. Back. Yeah, yeah, you're breathing, what else? Cool, these three people, what about this side of the room? Anybody else? Yeah. Furrow your brow. Yeah, you furrow your brow. And, and, and don't just think about the physical thing. For me, like, my stomach starts turning, I get real sweaty. I grip Always. my teeth. You what? I grip my teeth. Yeah, you grit your teeth, okay? So as you, yeah, as you feel these things, I wanna see it on a three, on a five or six, and then on like an eight or nine, cool? Okay, and then after my third one, I'm like, oh, and I'll go back. And then we all calm down. We immediately calm down. And then somebody else will step in and go, you know what I hate? And we'll do a couple of these, and then I'm going to change it up. Cool? So here we go. Do you know what I hate? Popcorn. Like Popcorn. Yes. Oh, I hate that it leaves that greasy stuff on your finger. Oh, oh shit. Yeah. And I hate when the kernels get stuck in your teeth. Oh, oh, and I hate how you have to drink like a gallon of water. Oh, oh, I love that next door they're like, how is the morning? Cool. Somebody else go in. You know what I hate? Posters. Oh my god, I can't stand posters and sticky things on the wall. You know what else I love? Oh, 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 oh. They fall off the wall. Oh, 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 oh. And the worst part, the absolute worst part Where is, is that the corners. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what 
I hate? Marshmallows! Marshmallows! I mean, they come in two sizes. I don't need choices. Oh, uh, the packaging is impossible to open. <laughs> they give me a requirement for making s'mores! Oh, ah! Cool, thanks. Now we're gonna switch it up. It's not called, do you know what I hate? It's called, do you know what I blank? So you can go, do you know what I love? And it will just show three levels of love or joy. Or you could go and, do you know what makes me nervous? Do you know what makes me excited? Uh, do you know what makes me like emotionally like vulnerable? You can go however you want with it. And then what everybody on the outside has to do is, is what we think, because we did the first one, like when you're angry, what happens? But now I want you to think of what happens when we do that. So as soon as somebody steps in, your improv skills all start kicking in. I'm like, okay, when I'm in love, what are things that happen? When I'm nervous, what happens? Cool? So any emotion you want, somebody step in and say, do you know what I, and then whatever you want. Do you know what turns me on? Kanye <laughs> <laughs> West. Oh. <laughs> so like a big, solid plate of chocolate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then when he's hot, he's sweaty, he's kind of like that melty chocolate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then you just want to like lick him. Oh, <laughs> To him, I mean, just a degradation to women. Oh, and then he's got this sick. side, the style that just yeah. looks like he threw things together. Oh. And then when I licked him, he tasted <laughs> salty. Oh. Hey, hey, here's the other hand. I sit on. Head back to your seat. Go ahead and go back to your seat. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So what you do? That, there's your answer. Yeah. Cool, yeah, it, it basically it allows into it, like when you're put on a spot, and that's why I love about improv, you're on the spot. But the thing is, when you're training kids for on the spot, don't make them do it by themselves. So at the beginning, if we're all doing that, it's just like, okay, what happens when you're nervous? What happens when you're, and then especially if you're working with, uh, again, with OP and stuff like that, uh, get, your, get all your interpreters together and play this game. But then what you do as the coach, is you've worked with kids and you're like, okay, in that one, he needs to show more, like, um, you, I need to see that he looks guilty in that moment, okay? So put that on your list. And you can, you can even have somebody go in, but don't have that kid go in, have somebody else go in and be like, hey, go, what makes me feel guilty? And then they'll do that and then you'll watch people and it, it, again, it just gives you a moment to think about that kind of thing, cool? Uh, another thing that helps, if you have kids that are just starting or newer kids on the team who wanna try it but are hesitant, uh, two things that I do in my class whenever we do anything like this is I be, I'm sure to shut the door and I tell them, I say, hey, that door is shut. There's no judgment in here. No one is coming from the outside to judge you. Do what you need to do. The other thing that I do when kids um, are either acting too cool is they're like, oh, I don't really know why I'm not going to. I say, yeah, you so want to know, cool. you know, know the only time that you are lame is when you're the one not participating. You're the, not, the one not giving 100%. That's when you look lame, is when you're the person taking down everybody else's good time or ruining that connection that everyone else has. So that's another good thing to kind of remind the kids is like, no, you're not going to be lame if you do this silly, dumb thing. You're going to be lame if you're the only person not doing this silly Yeah, my rule is if you're in the room, you participate. Um, I even told administrators that when they come in to observe me. I'm like, hey, we're going to warm up at the beginning. Can you come do it with us? Because we have a rule that nobody can watch because we feel like we're being judged if any one person is sitting outside. So my assistant principals don't observe me very often. <laughs> <laughs> or, or if they do, they come in 10 minutes into class because they know the war is going to happen at the beginning. But it, it does, I mean, all of my classes at the end of the year, I always have like, a, they write an assessment of me. And every, every year people are like, I feel like I can be myself in here. And my speech kids say, I feel like that. And my theater kids say, I can do this. Because the thing is, emotions, are one of the most vulnerable thing in the world. And we talk about this, and this is a good thing for uh, your interpreters. Um, when we show any emotion, our physicality says hide it. And, and, and obviously we know, like if I tell you all act sad, the first thing you do is you look down, like act really sad, you cover your face. It's just what we do. But the thing, same thing, when you see somebody on TV, it's like you just want a million dollars, the first thing you do is go, they're hiding their face. We're taught to do that. So now we're like, okay, now what do you do without using the, the hiding 
parts of your you know technique and stuff like that. So uh, allowing people to do an improv duo scene, stop it and go. Okay, go back 15 seconds. You showed me joy, but show me extreme joy. Knock that up to a 10, and then do it again. And then sometimes do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And the thing is, some people just feel reserved to do it. So I don't know how stupid you are as an adult, but don't take yourself too seriously. Get up and then go, all three of us right now are going to show joy. Start laughing and yelling and clapping and high-fiving. You go, okay, cool. Now two of us aren't feeling that joy, but your character is. Do it again. And now they felt, it's just like, look, we all look stupid together. Now I can let it go. And the thing is, what happens is they let it go, and then they see that the joy that it brings you as the coach, and then they start seeing how it brings the joy to the judges and the other people, uh, that are in the contestants in the room, and then they start loosening up. So especially uh, in, our, in our meeting just before this, I was talking to section five and six about like, don't get rid of events that are going to bring in new people. Like for the script of Duo and, the, uh, and Deck, whatever, I feel like those bring in new people. We need to bring them in teach them these types of fun things, and then let them go on to do uh, more stuff. So I, I feel like, like and this is me, now I feel like I'm trying to get you to vote a certain way, I kind of am. But the thing is like, <laughs> get, them, get them comfortable on these events, and then they'll go on and write OPs, and then they'll go on and do all these other things, but you get them comfortable, and a duo is a way that allows them to be comfortable. And improv duo is less pressure, because it's not something you're taking to, uh, to sectionals and state, but it's something that can make you better in your other events. And I think it also keeps you loose. Um, I, had a, I have a kid on my, he's the captain of my improv team. He's also been on the speech team for four years. Uh, he does HI and he's done duo and he's done a lot of other events or whatever. But he loves, he always says, I like doing improv duo when it's available to me because it allows some variety. Because I'm doing the same piece, you know, one, four times and then the other four. So I'm doing the same thing eight times. But adding that improv duo or whatever, switching out when I'm doing improv duo allows my brain to just be stupid for a little while. And, and it, it kind of keeps me loose for HI. And we kind of looked at his scores and he actually was doing better on his HI in, at meets where he was also using an improv duo. So it's just cool. It keeps him loose. And I was also going to say, does anyone have <coughs> mirrors or a mirror in their speech room or classroom or anything like that? Um, another good thing that you can do is have them play with the different emotions and different shapes that their face can make and their mouth can make. It's just have them look in a mirror and just find the different, just make faces and find the different like faces you can make and what that character is, what that emotion is, what that feeling is. And just like when I do my eye like this, it's different than when I do my eye like this, or when I do my eye like this, or this. And it's, it's a completely different character, it's a completely different emotion. And just have them look in the mirror and just play with their face. And just don't touch anything, don't move your hands. Just see what you can create with only your face. Yeah, and, or record them too. I like to record them and have them watch, but a lot of times we're not doing it as big as we think we are. And so having them just record on their phone and watch, you're like, oh crap, I thought I was better than that. And I'm like, nope, you weren't. Cool, but now, but now you both know that you weren't very good. Cool? Uh, are there other questions before our next fun exercise? Other questions? Other questions? No? Cool. Everybody go ahead and stand up for a second. This is one where you don't have to move around quite as much, stand. but stand up. Uh, so I want to talk to you about the, the CECE -E real quick. We kind of jumped to the emotion at the end because somebody asked a question on it, but my idea was to do a thing for each of the one. Um, first of all, right now you're standing, and I have my kids walk around. I'm not going to make you walk around because as adults we're all lazy. Good. Yeah, so, um, I have my kids walk around. You walk around and you're being yourself and you kind of recognize there's a, there was an acting professor at NYU who said you can't be good at characters until you realize what character you are and then erase it. So if you're somebody, if you walk around on the balls, like if your heels of your feet don't touch the ground too much, or you're somebody that puts your hands in your pockets, or you walk kind of holding your arms or whatever, I'm not judging the people doing those. Everybody's like, like he's talking about me. No, we all have just natural things we do. But when you walk, you learn to get rid of that kind of stuff. You look down at the ground, you do all these things, because what you do is recognize what you do. And when you're playing a character, all you have to do is stop doing what you do, and now you're doing something differently. Cool? So if all of you right now will just turn your feet in toward each other a little bit, Cool, and then bring your posture down a little bit. Cool, now I'm gonna say go, and you're all gonna do a monologue of what that character would sound like. Cool, it's just gonna be a five second monologue. And when, by the way, I say monologue, don't start with, hi, my name is blank, because you're not, it's not an introduction. I want you to talk about something they care about. Cool, ready, go. Can I
Thank you very much. Relax. Cool. Now we're going to go to the very opposite of that. Right now you guys are winning. Cool? Okay. Instead of turning your feet in toward each other, turn your feet out toward each other and push your shoulders back. Cool. Now, if you want to do something, yeah, exactly. Some people put their hands on their on their shoulders. Some of you cross your arms. Some of you kind of raise one eyebrow. Do whatever you want. Kind of add some variety to it. Cool. Five second monologue. Ready? Go. Cool. Thank you very much. That's two. Now, now here's here's what I always ask after we do the first two. Were those two drastically different from each other? Not just in physical, but do they sound different? Okay, so now what I want you to do, and I'm not going to tell you what to do, but change something about your posture, about your face, about the way you hold your hands, change something else. Physically change, I want to see something, I want to see something, there you go, there you go, there you go. Cool, five second monologue, ready, go. Oh my God. <laughs> louder, louder, go. Cool, thank you very much, and you can relax, cool. That's the easiest way to make a character. Once you once you talk to a person like we're going to be in a casino or whatever, give yourself your idea. Then you can pop into a character. For mine, I just I just kind of had shoulders back a little bit, and he was playing with cards. So like in my brain, like he works at a casino, but he always has his cards. So you can do something like that. Cool. So now what you can do? I got my character. He's got his shoulders back. That's kind of who I wanted to go with. And then the second thing I did was think of a physical. So now go back to that character you just made, where you uh, you changed something about your appearance. Now what I want you to do is, what is something that they would do when they're just kind of sitting or standing around? Okay, so my guy played with cards. What's something your person could physically do? Cool, start doing it. You don't, you're not talking for this one. Just start doing something you can physically do. Just do the thing. Cool, and then relax. Here's the thing. At the beginning of a scene, right away, both people try and talk to each other and start doing something. That's bad. Because when you watch a movie, normally lines don't start right away. Normally we get some exposition by seeing them do something. So again, at the beginning, Ben started pulling on the slot. And I was just like shuffling cards and kind of watching what was going on, whatever. But there was a character and there was a physical. Now what you do is you keep that character. You keep that physical. You start doing that. And now you start interacting. You can have a seat. Because I'm going to talk about two more things. And then I'm done. Ben has any more to add. Well, I was going to add one. Go, go, go. Real quick. Um, and it's simple. Tell your kids they don't have to overthink it. If I'm standing here and I'm ready to go and we're just talking about our scene, I merely do this and turn my arms this way. I'm now a character. It's very simple. All I got to do is go, all right, begin. Mom. And now I'm somebody completely different and all I did was go, change one small thing about your body, you instantly now have a character. Yeah, because a lot of people will, will do, when you say play a character, they'll be like, oh, I can do a French accent. And so there's a, you speak a voice from people from France, and you are, but there's nothing different about your physical. As soon as you listen to the other person for a few seconds and you talk again, you're like, yes, I, oh, crap. And then your brain's like, you messed up, the character's gone. But if you have a physical change, it reminds you to keep the verbal change as well. Cool? Um, now I just want to give you a couple of rules of improv because we talked about your character, we talked about your environment, now I say you start talking. A couple of rules of improv. If it, does anybody know the number one rule of improv? Scott Black. Don't negate. Don't negate, okay? That means don't say no. The, the, the term is yes and. Yes, comma, and. If your kids are bad at negating and they keep telling the other person no, literally make them do a scene where every line except the first one is yes and and then they say something and the other person yes and and they go back and forth and that, that teaches agreement and add to it okay yes means i'm agreeing with what's going on because if a scene starts with a denial it's just like hey let's go to mcdonald's nope. okay. uh you want to go on a roller coaster Really. Okay, and, and then you feel like you can't get anything done, and I've performed with that guy a million times in my life, and it's and it, it's frustrating. So just get in the habit of, uh, it's, it's like, let's go to McDonald's. Sure. And then we start going, and then add something to it. I got this bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your pee bucket from earlier? Yeah, so you, you <laughs> add to it, okay? Uh, so yes and is the first rule. The second rule is don't ask questions. Don't ask questions because that puts all the work on the other person. That's the other thing I'm getting. Yeah. Well, well, no, I was going to say the worst thing because your kids all the time want to create suspense and they'll do it by going, oh my gosh, what's that? Yeah. I don't know because you pointed at it. 
Yeah, yeah. you yeah. had the idea, you better solve it. Don't put it on that other person. It's not, what is that? It's, that's a freaking bear, okay? It's, that's a thing, and it's very real, and it's gonna come and kill us right now. We have to react to that. Instead of going, that's a thing, or the worst that you're gonna get your kids is, look at this thing. What do you think it is? It certainly is. <laughs> yeah, you don't know, like, nobody wants to make the choice, and sometimes they'll try and do this real clever thing. It's just like, are you sure we should go? Yeah, let's go. Wow, look at it. I can't believe it looks like that. And the, I'm, I'm going to be vague until you describe what it might like. so be. Yeah. Nobody wants to take that next step, but make the choice because it allows uh, for people to go there. So we have uh, don't ask questions. You make statements. You say yes and. You means you agree with it. And now we go back to the CE, the conflict and emotion. We already talked about how to get the emotion out of them. But anything becomes a conflict. And the very most of us said, oh, let's go to McDonald's. That's just a statement. But that can be the conflict by somebody going, you know my grandpa died at McDonald's. Why are you, don't bring that up. Okay, it's like, they're it's like, no, I was just trying to start a scene, right? But the thing is, once we care about it, now it's go, it turns into something like, you know my grandpa died, it's time to move on, Doris. You know, and then like, you have two people arguing about how Doris can't let things go. But he's still in that McDonald's. No, he's not, okay? Okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, we still have that. Okay, but that's the thing, you want to watch emotion, okay? That's all I have. Is there anything else you want to add to everything we've done? Um, Are there any other questions while Ben thinks? Yeah. Um, I will say, when we said environment, you said just start doing something, don't feel like you have to talk. The same can go in the middle of a scene. Yeah. If you've got there and you feel like you've hit a wall, go back to the emotion or do an emotion. Um, we always joke in comedy sports that you'll see people who will grab a cup, or they'll eat some cake, or my thing for some reason is like shellacking a surfboard. I mom. I mom. Almost always, I'll just be like, what? <sighs> and, but and it gives your brain time to think about where we're going. But it's an interesting choice. It's not be going, well, I, I'm doing something that's worth watching, and you're going, why is he shellacking that surfboard? <laughs> All right, and it, it makes you, the audience and the judge will be like, I want to know where this is going. And then I can be like, there's just a distance between us. And now I've had time to think about where I want to go now. And, uh, and I, I guess one last thing for me that notice we're talking about it's a distance between us, or uh, he's not there anymore, and we keep making it about each other. Don't make it about what you're doing. We talked about don't make it a transaction scene or a teaching oh. scene. Uh, don't make it about that physical. It's about the people. We care more about relationships than anything else. So do that. I, I saw our friend Todd in a scene one time where the whole scene, he was setting up something. He was like playing a little kid, and he was setting up something very intricate. We never found out what it was. But through the whole scene, he was like, yeah, it's going to be great. And he's put, in my head, he was putting up teeny little green army men all <laughs> over the scene. But the, the two of them were talking about uh, why uh, it was, oh, it's about Christmas and about like all the family members who were going to be there and talking about it. But he's setting up this huge intricate thing and never talks about it. But the thing, like he said, it's just interesting to watch. And the thing is, if there's a quiet moment, they both just set him up and he'd be like, I'm sad Uncle Jeff is dead. Whatever, you're like, whoa, that took a twist. But again, it gives you time to come up with ideas. That's the, the, the whole point we're trying to get you to do is to try this and get your kids to be good at it because it's not just going to help them in this event. It will make them better in other events as well. Cool? Any last minute questions before we all clap and yeah. walk away? Do you guys have any resources for some of those uh, kind of fun games that you didn't want? Improvencyclopedia.org. Mm -hmm. There's a million warm-ups on there. There's a million improv games you can play on there. And I will tell you a secret, kind of giving away my Fisher secret. Because I have an improv team, and a lot of those improv kids are on the speech team, one thing worth kind of debating, trying at an a improv duo event, is actually playing an improv game within uh, a game and not telling the judge that we're doing it. Like, there, like there's one, it's just an alphabet game where you go, like the first line starts with an A and the next line starts with a B. I'm like, I dare you to play that one of your rounds today. Okay, and if the judge catches on, great. But like, we're not going to tell them that we're doing that or whatever. Um, you can play a game of uh, sit, stand, kneel, where there's two people, but but they can never be doing the same thing. If one of them is sitting, well, the other person has to be either standing or kneeling. So whenever one of them moves, the other one has to adjust 
and then justify why they did it. Or, or an instant soap opera. Instant soap opera. Or yeah. one person has to be staring off into the distance. Uh, one person looks at someone and they can't make eye contact. And so whenever one person, the other one has to look away. They can bite a knuckle, they can splay out across something, things like that, where you're playing a game in it, you're paying attention, and you're doing good scene work, they have no idea you're playing a game within your scene. But there's something intriguing about it, because again, it's different. And anytime anybody, one of my, anytime one of my parents judges, I always ask, who won and why? I don't want to know about the, all the ones that were train wrecks. I just want to know about the good ones and why. And and it, the, the number one answer is it was it was different from the rest of them in some way. And by the way, a lot of schools are doing it like a duo where they can't look at each other. They can look at each other and they can touch each other. And probably so much better when they can look at each other. Any other questions? Cool, let's clap our hands and walk away. Well, thanks guys. That's all. That's fine. My music should start playing because I've seen it. I can be a man in motion. Oh, I need it.